to developing committed disciples, and we're going to talk about how you can move people from the uh, congregation into the committed. Uh, how do you take them from just being uh, an attender, someone who just shows up whenever they want to at church, to being a member, and that's someone who actually belongs uh, to the church and is committed to the church. And then the next step is, is we want them to be committed uh, to growing in Christ. Uh, in the Purpose Driven Community, we say that we want to be as committed to one another as we are to Jesus Christ. And so it's all, all about the commitments that we, that we develop. So uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 9 says, Our greatest wish and prayer is that you will become mature Christians. Ephesians 4, 12, So that God's people will be equipped to do better work for him, building up the church, the body of Christ, to a position of strength and maturity. And then Ephesians 4, 13, Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience into maturity until finally we all believe and become full grown in the Lord. Yes, to the point of being filled full with Christ. Uh, you know, what a tremendous thing we aspire to. What a tremendous offering that we, we, we have to give to people as the church. Uh, the fact that they can be less like themselves. I long, I long to be less like myself and more like Jesus Christ. I'll just tell you, I am so tired of being me. <laughs> I'm just so tired of living with my frailties and my sins, and I just long to become more and more like Jesus Christ. And what a tremendous gift we have for that, for our, not only for ourselves, but also to be off, offering that to our people in our church. And so we have five powerful tools uh, that purpose-driven churches use to cultivate spiritual growth. And so what are they? Number one, we use commitment cards commitment cards. And I'm going to walk you through each one of these and talk to you about how to use it. Uh, number two, we use classes. Number three, we use covenants. Number four, we use small groups. And number five, we use campaigns. So the first thing are commitment cards. And we use these to help people to uh, respond. And we do this a couple of different ways uh, at our church. Uh, when people come in, everyone who comes into a service gets what we call a communication card. And that's a card that asks them for their basic information, their name, their address, their phone, their email. And we'll even ask some questions like, uh, you know, what age group do you fall into? Are you married? Do you have kids? How did you hear about us? We've got a series of questions that we ask. And we, uh, we give those out to everybody who comes in every week. We encourage our church people to fill those out every week. And it's sort of a way for us to uh, track their attendance. And it gives them an opportunity. And I encourage my people in the membership class, I talk about, you know, when you fill out the communication card, even though you've already filled it out before, you know, you get a lot of pushback on that. People that, you know my name, you know my address, you know my phone number. Why do I have to fill that out every time I come? And so I always tell them, well, then just put your name on there and then just act like you're filling out the rest of it. Okay? Because when you fill it out, then the, the visitor is there and they're looking around and, oh, oh, people, fill, I'm not the only one filling this out. Everybody's filling it out. And we just say in, in our greeting, you know, we encourage all of you to fill it out, drop it in the offering bag at the end of the service, and you just create an attitude uh, this is one of the things that we do. We just fill that out. And that encourages uh, the newcomers to come, to fill it out. And, uh, but that's the communication card. Now, sometimes on that communication card, we will also have commitment questions. And for instance, whatever our sermon series is about, or if there's a, uh, an event that's happening at church, we, we give people the opportunity to make a commitment and they can make it on that card, uh, the communication card. Sometimes we have just a separate commitment card uh, that we'll have them fill out. It'll be in regards to a step of spiritual growth that we're wanting them to take. I'm going to read my Bible every day for the next 40 days or while we're doing this series, or uh, I'm going to uh, commit to, I'm going to come to every service, or I'm going to be committed to a small group, or I'm going to finish the class uh, discipleship process, the diamond. But you can ask them to 
make a commitment and fill out a, commu a commitment card and turn it in during a service. And uh, you know, you if you don't ask people to make those commitments, you you won't get it. Uh, you know, you can just talk about we're all need to do this. We it's important. This, we're doing this as a church family. But it's when you ask them to make a personal commitment and to actually acknowledge it by by filling something out, taking a step of action. Yes, I'm going to fill this out. I'm going to stick it in this uh, in the offering bag or or do whatever you're going to do with it. And so you want to just ask him to do it. And this is how you ask. Uh, first, you ask confidently. Uh, you know, as the pastor, uh, you just got to believe that your people are going to respond to these commitments. Uh, there's just sort of a, that's just how God works. God puts stuff out there. We believe it and, and things happen. So don't be afraid to ask your people for commitment. Don't be afraid to ask them to, to sign and to, to state what those commitments are. Uh, you want to ask as specifically as possible. You want to be as, as clear as you can be. What is the commitment that you're looking for? Uh, you know, I'm going to attend a small group. I'm going to attend every time over the next six weeks. Uh, I'm going to come to the weekend service you know, every time for the next six weeks. Or uh, wh whatever it is. Be, the more specific you are, the more powerful the commitment that comes. You know, if the commitment is just, I'm going to love Jesus more than I've loved him before. Well, what does that mean? How? What are the steps? What are you going to take? What are you going to do? So be specific. Uh, you want to explain the benefits. You want to you know, what are the benefits of making a commitment to being, uh, coming every service, coming uh, to the small group, or making the, the financial commitment or the uh, daily reading commitment that they're going to make. Uh, let them know what the benefits are. And then you want to allow for baby steps. Uh, you want to give people the, uh, the option. Uh, you know, for years we were trying to get people to get plugged into our small groups. And, and uh, we had a, a lot of people in groups. We had a lot of people who weren't in groups. And so we came up with the idea that, you know, just, just make a commitment that you're going to go one time. Just make a commitment. I'm going to visit a small group. I'm going to go see what a small group is like. And, uh, and we had lots of people who signed up to do that who had never signed up to join a small group before. They never joined because they'd never been to one. They didn't know what it was like. They didn't know what was going to happen if they went. And so rather than getting them to commit to being in small groups for the rest of their life, we said, will you just commit to go and experiment, go and try it. And so you can offer them some baby steps on that. But we found that as you make those presentations in a message from the senior pastor to the people and ask them to respond, that we'll get a, a solid response. And, you know, we'll get a stack of cards, you know, that high that people have filled out. Well, now you know who they are. You know what their commitment is made. We pass those out to staff and pray for those people. And, uh, we, you know, we try to make personal contact with them about the commitments that they make. It's, it's a great tool that uh, helps you seal uh, the deal on their commitment. Uh, the next thing that we uh, use is class, uh, and that's just a, a purpose-driven class system that introduces each of God's five purposes. And the, uh, in our church, we offer uh, the classes uh, every month. The first week of the month, we offer 101. The second week of the month, we offer 201. Third week of the month, we offer 301. Fourth week of the month, we offer 401. And uh, we actually don't have a 501 class. And they mention it here, but uh, I don't think Saddleback even has a 501 class. Uh, 501, they treat more as a personal uh, retreat kind of a thing because it deals with the issue of worship. But uh, there is class material that you can, uh, you can get from Saddleback that will give you the content they use in, uh, in 101, which is the membership class, and then 201, the spiritual maturity class, and so on. But what I found uh, is that by offering those classes at every month, you create momentum. You create uh, an energy. And you, sometimes you may offer the class, you won't have anyone show up. But you've offered it, and you offer it faithfully. And then sometimes you'll have you know, lots of people show up, but, uh, you know, it, it, just imagine if you offer it 12 times and you have one to five people show up every, every time, well, 
you know, if you got five people that show up over 12 months, that would be 60 new members that you could have have in your in your in your church. You know, that would be could be 60 people that you've got who are committed uh, to spiritual growth. 60 people who are committed to being involved in ministry. I mean, it's it's the power of offering it uh, routinely. Uh, we offer it regardless of what, what happens. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, this past year, Easter Sunday fell on the first Sunday of the month. And uh, I've actually stepped out of the role of senior pastor at my church. I've now become the founding pastor. And I turned the, the key leadership over to my son, who's uh, 32, and he's now our senior, our lead pastor. And so for years, 22 years, I taught the membership class. I think the, the senior pastor ought to teach the membership class. And then uh, two years ago, I turned it over to him, and he started teaching the membership class. I do a little video section in there where they get to know who I am. But uh, we have family dinner on Easter Sunday. You know, most Christians do. You, you go to church for, and then go to a family home and, and have a big Easter dinner. And so I asked my son, are you going to teach the membership class on Easter Sunday? And he said, uh, yeah, we just, that's what we do. First Sunday of every month, we, uh, we teach the membership class. So he showed up at our family dinner late, and I said, so do you have anybody come to the class? Because I'm thinking, Who, who's going to come to a membership class on Easter Sunday? And he goes, yeah, we had five people. And I said, well, that's great. And he said, do you know who comes to a membership class on Easter Sunday? And I said, no, who? He said, unbelievers. He said, all five of those people were unbelievers, and three of them gave their heart to Christ in our membership class. You know, that's the power of us having a focus of, it's not just about us, it's not just about the Christian community, we're open, we're trying to serve unbelievers, and you create these processes that are available for people outside of your church and outside of your normal sphere of thinking, and great things like that happen. So we wound up uh, with three uh, brand new believers who made the commitment uh, to the uh, to church membership and uh, actually signed up to be baptized. Uh, we baptize the third Sunday of every month. And uh, we just have it scheduled. We make it available for people all the time. Tell them if you want to get baptized, third Sunday of the month, you can do it. And uh, this past week, how many, David, you remember how many said, did, I, did we have 10? I think it was we had 10 signed up this weekend. And that's very normal for us, to have anywhere from 9 to 10 people that are signed up for baptism every month. So there's power in, in offering these. Uh, and so the goal is that you want to uh, help people start living out each one of the purposes. And so you're going to teach them how to do that uh, in this class. Uh, Saddleback's classes, in your notes, they offer, a, a, it's four hours long, and they do it with a meal. They do like two hours, then have a meal, and then do another two hours. Uh, we've shortened our classes. Our classes are an hour and 15 minutes. And we don't have a meal. Uh, we just have a snack. And, uh, but we've uh, worked on our material and, and, and found in our culture that it worked better to shorten that a little bit. But the key is not so much how long. It's the material that's offered in there and the fact that it's offered every month. You just, you know, if you wait until you think you've got enough people, a big number of people to have a big membership class, the, the delay and how long you wait uh, really works against you. I would rather teach the class, if, I'd rather not have the class if nobody signs up but still offer it than to not offer it for months waiting for somebody to want to take it. And I'd rather teach it to one person than, than wait. And what, I, what we found is, is that by offering the classes routinely, you create that momentum and you wind up with a good number of people taking it. Uh, so you want to do it monthly. Uh, then who teaches the class? Uh, your volunteers and, and staff can teach the class. Senior pastor really needs to teach the membership class. But uh, I have staff members who teach. Uh, class 201 is my small group pastor. Class 301 is a volunteer in my church who is just really good at, at the area of ministry and recruiting people for ministry. And then the, the 401 class is another staff member. But uh, pastor, the senior pastor, you don't have to teach uh, all of them. You can actually uh, pass them out to other people. Uh, you can get the class materials at uh, www.pastors.com. 
but the result is you wind up with consistent month by month growth. Once you get it uh, in place, you just keep doing the same thing. Uh, if when you first institute this, you may have some of your old time members who uh, think, oh, you mean I have to take a membership class? I've already been a member, been a member here for years. You're going to make me take a member. Don't make the mistake of, of making this a have to. Don't make it a requirement for people who are already in your church. Make it a you get to. Make it a, a benefit. And, uh, and just tell them, you know, we're going to be teaching this to all the new people that come. And so if you want to get the training that they get, if you want to know what we're telling them, if you want the benefit of, uh, of the class, well, you're certainly welcome to come. And, uh, and next thing you know, they'll, you'll create an atmosphere where people will want to attend the classes and uh, be able to go through it. Um, we have changed the terminology in that we don't call it Class 101, Class 201. But we call it Step 1, Step 2, Step 3, Step 4. And we found that a lot of people uh, in our culture, men especially, they're not interested in going to a class. You know, when they graduated from school or got done with school, they were done going to classes. They don't want to go to a class. But if you tell them, you know, you want to take your next step in your spiritual journey, we've got four steps. Take step one, take step two, take step three. And, uh, and, and people will, will respond to that. Uh, for us, we don't require them to take them uh, in order. They have to take all four of them but they don't have to take them in order. So if they want to come to step three, fine, come. Take step three, get that material. But before they get plugged into uh, a ministry, before they can be seen as having finished the, the system, they have to take all four of them. But we found that it, it's real hard. People won't, won't take them, uh, a lot, some people won't be able to take them in sequence, and they certainly don't take them all in one month. You know, they'll come and take the membership class, and then it may be two or three months before they'll take uh, the next class. And it may be another two or three months before they'll take the next one. But uh, probably the average is over six months, they'll get through them all. Some people will do it bang, 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 and some people will stretch it out, stretch it out more. But that's why you want to just keep offering it, just keep making that opportunity available. Uh, the third tool that we have are covenants. And, uh, you know, the, the, these are the most important part of each one of the, the classes is the covenant. And so the class isn't designed just to give you information. The class is designed to get you to make a commitment. And the commitment is done in the form of a covenant that we offer at the end of each class. And so you, you want to determine for the class what is it that you want them to do as a result of the class and build that into uh, their uh, the covenant. And uh, you've got a biblical example of people signing a spiritual covenant in Nehemiah's day. Uh, Nehemiah 9.38 says, In view of all this, we are making a binding covenant, putting it in writing, and our leaders, our Levites, and our priests are affixing their seals to it. So when do they sign the covenant? Well, at the end of each one of the classes. Uh, we actually have a time at the end of the class where uh, you make a decision if you want to sign the covenant, uh, you can sign it and, and turn it in. And the purpose is to just raise the level of maturity and commitment in people by making a clearly stated and a serious uh, commitment. Uh, so here's why, why, why they help. Uh, number one, we become whatever we are committed to. We become whatever we're committed to. And so if we're committed to the great commandment and the great commission, it's going to grow a great church. It'll grow a great Christian if you get these commitments into your people. Uh, number two, every church is defined by what it is committed to. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.8, wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. So people in your community will know what your church is like <coughs> by what your church is committed to. And in our community, we, uh, the, in the Christian community and even in the unchristian community, People know we're serious about mature, uh, being mature Christians, about Christian growth, Christian health, living a, a solid Christian life, and we offer a pathway uh, for them to be able to do that. Uh, number three, people want to be committed to something that gives them significance. 
Matthew 4.19, Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Uh, we found that the more serious we get about commitment, the more people respond. Uh, people in this day, they're, they're looking for meaning. They're looking for something to fill the void in their life. They're looking for something that makes a difference. And so they're not afraid of a commitment. In fact, the more, the more we raise the, the bar of commitment in our church, we find people find people responding. Uh, number four, if your church doesn't ask for your people's commitment, others will. If you don't ask for their commitment, well, the, the, their child's school will, or their, uh, their, the company they work for, they'll ask for them. They'll ask for their time, their energy, their money, their children's athletic programs. You know, you sign a kid up for football or or, uh, you know, in our case, it's baseball here. It's probably cricket. You know, if you've got a, a kid's team, well, you know, you've got to be committed to go to practices. You have to show up for games. You have to bring treats. You have to buy equipment. You have to, there's just a lot of commitment that's involved in that. So don't be afraid to ask people for commitment. Because if you don't, the world will. And the better that they're given their commitment to the church and to Jesus Christ. Uh, the greater the commitment you ask for, the greater response you get. Any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. You read through the Gospels and you see Jesus. He's, he keeps turning up the commitment. You know, it's just come and see. Come and see. See what, see what the kingdom of God is like. And then it, it's come and grow. Come and learn. And then pretty soon... It's, it's come and eat my flesh and drink my blood. And pretty soon it's come and take up your cross and follow me. Uh, you know, he, throughout the Gospels, he's turning up the commitment more and more and more. And so the greater the commitment that you ask for, the greater the response you get. I love the story of the youth pastor who uh, wanted to have a, uh, a sunrise service on Easter Sunday. And so he said, we're going to do a sunrise service on Easter Sunday. We're going to do it uh, down at this, uh, this park over here. This is for all the youth in our church. And so the kids started asking, well, are you going to drive us? Are you going to provide the transportation? Are you going to, you know, how are we supposed to get there? How are we going to get home? And he said, you know, this, you want to come? You figure out how to get there. You have to provide your own transportation. You have to get yourself up. You have to get down there. And he had over 100 students show up uh, for that event. And that was different because for v events where he provided the transportation, where he picked them up, where he babysat them, took care of every step along the way, he was lucky if he had 35, 40 kids show up. And what he learned was that when he gave them a challenge and when he let them uh, pr uh, operate out of their desire and out of their drive and their commitment, he, he got a greater response. And you may find the same to be true uh, with the adults in your church as well. Fourth tool that we use to uh, grow people is small groups. Small groups. We say of our church that we are a, a church of small groups, not a church with small groups. Okay? We're a church of small groups, not a church with small groups. That's how vital a part of our a strategy and structure small groups are. And so you want to uh, structure your small groups around the purposes and the habits that produce spiritual growth. And so, you know, every church has got to grow larger and smaller uh, at the same time. You want to grow larger in worship, larger in your weekend service, and you want to grow smaller uh, in your small groups. You want to give people uh, those two types of gatherings. Uh, we see in Acts 5, it says, they met day after day in the temple courts and from house to house. And so in the temple courts, they had a large group worship celebration. And then they had small group fellowship house to house. And you've got a number of scriptures that say, greet the church that meets in their home. So you, you, you like to offer both the weekend worship service, large group, small groups throughout the week, meeting house to house. So what are the personal benefits of being in a small group? Well, first, it's the best place to practice real fellowship. You know, you come into a church service that's got 200 people in it, uh, you can't know everybody there, you can't talk to everybody there. Especially if you come in and you sit in rows. 
All you do is sit there and look at the back of somebody's head. There's, you know, that's not, a, that's not a time of fellowship. But you get into a small group. Well, now you can, now you, it's a few people. You can get to know them. And now you sit in circles. You sit in a living room or around a table. And you look one another face to face. That gives you an opportunity for real, real fellowship. Uh, it helps me apply God's word better because I can ask questions. You know, in a church service, a large group service, I'm the pastor, I'm teaching, I'm not asking for questions from the people on the floor. You know, that would just, that would, in that setting, it would be disruptive and it would take forever. But in a small group setting, you're doing a study and somebody has a question, it's very natural to ask the question and get an answer. Uh, it provides the accountability that I need to grow. You know, you've got a church service of 200 people and someone's not there, you don't know if they're there or not. But you've got a small group of six people and somebody's missing, you know they're missing. Where are they at? You can contact them and find out. Uh, it offers support when I'm under stress. You know, uh, the small group can uh, understand what each person is going through and offer to, to help them. Uh, it's a safe place to develop my shape for ministry. Uh, in the small group, you can give people opportunities to minister and serve uh, that are very safe because it's just for a small group of friends. And so somebody can maybe lead worship or someone can pray or uh, you know, someone can put together a fellowship activity. Someone can put together a, a ministry project for the group to do. And uh, it, you know, if it doesn't work out, uh, it's a safe place to fail. And we just love each other and encourage each other, and, and you can de develop your skills over time. And it's a natural, relaxed way to share my faith with unbelievers. Uh, it can be a, a little bit daunting to ask someone for work. It may be uh, daunting to, to them or uh, over uh, difficult for them to come to a large group of, of uh, people, come to a large church service. But to just ask uh, someone from work, hey, would you like to come over to my house? I'm having some friends over. And they show up, and, and it's your small group. So it's a very natural way to invite them. Uh, a lot of traditional churches have had Sunday school over the years, and so there's a, a real shift in trying to move from Sunday school to, um, to small groups. And uh, here's some advantages of doing that. First, you have more time to accomplish your purposes. Uh, you know, a Sunday school class lasts about an hour, and a small group can last an hour and a half, two hours. Some of our small groups last longer than that. You know, it's just an evening spent together in a home. Uh, it has a better atmosphere for real fellowship to happen. And uh, again, there's just something warmer and uh, more inviting about spending time together in a home than spending time in a classroom. Uh, home groups are infinitely expandable. Uh, home groups are geographically unlimited. Home groups are reproducible worldwide. And home groups are good stewardship. Well, the reason is, is that if you're going to keep growing a Sunday school, and keep, it's going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, you're going to have to build a bigger building. And it's expensive to build big education wings in churches. And uh, then you not only do you have to build the building, but now you've got to heat it, and cool it, put lights into it, you've got to put plumbing into it, you've got to provide all the furniture and the supplies for it. It's a tremendously expensive endeavor to keep getting a larger and larger Sunday school. But if you have small groups, then now all of that expense is borne by the people in your congregation. You know, they're paying the water bill, they're paying the electric bill, they're buying the furniture. And so you can add as many small groups as you want to because the more people that come, uh, the more houses uh, that you have for the small groups to meet in. So three weaknesses of Sunday school, you gotta build buildings to house it. Uh, Sunday school uses up parking, uh, you know, if you're gonna, uh, for that length of time too. And uh, some people won't bring unbelievers uh, to a service if they plan to ascend, attend Sunday school. They might be able to get an unbelieving friend to come to the worship service, but it's going to be harder to get that unbelieving friend to want to go to a class as well. And so um, there's some benefits to small groups and homes. Uh, you want to make sure your small groups are purpose-driven, like the first church, and all five purposes that happened in each one of the, um, one of the home groups. 
Uh, first, they grew spiritually. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They fellowshiped. It says they joined in the fellowship. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. It says they worshiped. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and prayer. So they celebrated the Lord's Supper. They also had a prayer time. And they were praising God in their, in, from house to house. They ministered to each other. It says they gave to anyone as he had a need. You know, in a small group, when people have needs, now, now they have people who know them. And they have people who know what the real need is, and they know how to truly be able to help them. And so the needs are met in a much more uh, authentic way in a small group. And then number five, they evangelized their community. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So the secret to that is that within your small group, you want to appoint what we call a champion for each one of the, one of the purposes. And I have a, I'm a, in, a, in a men's small group. I have, uh, there's six of us men that meet Sunday morning, 7.15, for my small group. And, uh, and in that group, we've got uh, guys identified. Uh, Cece, uh, he's our fellowship guy, because he's got the gift. And so he's, he plans events for us to do things fun together. He's the one who makes sure that we're connected and praying for each other. Uh, we've got a guy in there, uh, uh, Mark, who's on our worship team, and so Mark can help us with worship needs in our small group. And uh, we've got um, uh, uh, another Mark who uh, is actually, uh, I often have him lead uh, the group because he's a good teacher, a good Bible teacher. And so I actually step out of that role and say, hey, Mark, would you uh, lead the study, lead the group? So he's our discipleship uh, champion. And another guy, Mitch, he has a real heart for ministry, and so he finds ministry projects for our small group to do. And we do ministry group projects for the church, and then we also do ministry projects outside of the church uh, to help our testimony outside. But the idea is we want our small group to be doing all uh, five of the purposes, and so we identify people who have those gifts to help the, the group to do it. Uh, small groups also build spiritual habits into your group. Uh, you can help your people develop spiritually. Uh, it's one of the, that's one of the best things you can do for them. And the spiritual idea of spiritual habits is less threatening than saying uh, spiritual disciplines. Uh, we like to use that term habits. Uh, Dostoevsky, a great Russian guy, said the second half of a man's life is determined by the habits he acquired during the first half. And so in each of the classes from 101 to 501, we teach the habits of the Christian life. And specifically in 201, uh, we teach the essential habits of a daily time with God, a weekly tithe to God, and a committed team for God. And so in our small group, uh, we, we build in uh, daily readings, daily contacts. All, all the guys in my group, we, we get a group text every day with uh, uh, information about the devotional that we're all reading together. And uh, so we get a daily time with God uh, in our small groups. We work through often material that talks about uh, how to manage your finances and how to be a good steward and how to give to the Lord. And then also you're committed uh, to the ministry and the focus of the team by being a part of a small group. So those are the tools that we use. Uh, got a thing here uh, called why don't most believers grow to maturity and there's four reasons why they don't grow and then I want to give you the antidote to that uh, first they don't examine the direction of their lives on a regular basis most people don't don't evaluate their spiritual condition uh, routinely they just kind of go along until something blows up or life becomes hard or falls apart and then they try and figure out what went wrong. But the Bible uh, tells us that we really want to uh, look closely at our lives, we want to examine our lives, we want to test ourselves. Uh, the, the third verse in that sequence says, give yourselves regular checkups. So in our small groups, one of the things we do is a checkup. Every time we get together, we go, okay, this is what we talked about last week. Have you been doing that? Did you do that last week? And what happened? 
and, and uh, we can talk about our successes and our failures and shortcomings and encourage one another, but we keep checking back on uh, where are we at, how are we doing. We, we learned that last week, we said we were going to do it, what did we do? Uh, next, uh, number two, they don't, feed, they don't feed on God's word on a daily basis. And so uh, this is the, the, uh, the habit of hearing the word of God every day. So in our small groups, we encourage people to spend time in the word every day. And so our small group studies have daily devotionals or at least uh, a Bible verse that we want people to read every day. So that's the idea of hearing the word. Uh, the third uh, thing, the reason why people don't grow is they don't apply and practice what they learn. Because the truth is, I don't really know it until I do it. And so we want to, in every small group, we want to give them, okay, this is what we're going to do this week. This is the commitment that we're making. This is the action step that we're going to take. And so we have a, a way to act on the word. It's not just a matter of knowing it. What am I going to do this week in order to, to act on it? And then the fourth reason people don't grow is they don't pass it on to others. Uh, they don't pass on what they know. And uh, uh, Psalm 96.2 says, Each day tell someone that he saves. And so as part of our small groups, we ask the question, Who are you going to tell this week? Who are you going to teach this lesson to uh, yourself? And so if you look at that, there, there's four things that we do in our small groups. We, we do checkups. We hear the word. We act on it or apply it, and we tell others or teach it. And that, if you look at that, that's C-H-A-T, chat. And so we, we often refer to our small groups as chat groups. We're going to check up, we're going to hear the word, we're going to apply it, and we're going to uh, tell somebody else about it. Uh, the fifth tool that we use is campaigns. And... Um, we use an annual spiritual growth campaign. We typically do it in the fall. In fact, we just finished it this past weekend. We did a 10-week spiritual growth campaign. And a spiritual growth campaign is an intensive, extended, all-church emphasis involving every age group that focuses on a particular aspect of spiritual growth. And so in the fall, we pick out uh, usually about a 10-week period and uh, we ha our sermons are on that topic. We have uh, daily Bible readings, daily devotionals that we give everybody that are related to that topic. Mm -hmm. And then our small groups study that topic. We teach that topic in our children's ministry. We teach it uh, in our youth ministry. We get everybody in the church all on the same page focused on uh, the same thing. And there's just a, a real synergy. There's a real power that comes together uh, when, we, uh, when we do that as a church. Get everybody on the same page, headed in the same direction, uh, doing all of those things. Hearing a sermon in a small group, doing daily, uh, daily reading. And uh, Saddleback has a list of campaigns that they've done here that, that have happened over the years. And um, I, I would testify as well that, that the campaigns have been significantly uh, crucial to our growth and health. And we've actually done some of the campaigns more than once. Uh, you know, we've, uh, we've been a purpose-driven church for 22 years, and so we've probably done the 40 Days of Purpose uh, three, I, th I think maybe even four times. Uh, we've done uh, the uh, uh, campaign on 40 Days in the Word. We've done that more times. And uh, we just did, the one we just did was called Building My Life on Values That Last. And it's the second time that we've... <coughs> Uh, that we've been through that campaign. So don't be afraid to repeat the material. Uh, if your church is growing, you'll have a lot of people who weren't there when you, when you did the campaign before. Uh, even if the people who've gone through it before, they, they didn't get everything they could get out of it. You know, I, as a pastor, I never apologize for preaching the same sermon more than once. And I don't apologize for uh, taking our people through campaigns multiple times because uh, nobody gets it all the first time. You're always at a different place in your life, different life situation. You know, the Word of God is living. And uh, so it doesn't hurt you to, to hear it again. So here's why you should do campaigns, five transformation components. One is it, it provides for a unified prayer emphasis. You have everybody in the church praying for that season, 
praying for that topic. And, um, uh, you know, we, we pray. We start praying before the campaign starts. We do a 21-day lead-up uh, of prayer and, and, uh, and preparation. It's a concentrated focus. You've got the entire church family doing the same thing. And uh, there's, there's power in that. Uh, there's multiple reinforcement. They hear it in the sermon. They hear it uh, in the daily reading. They hear it in their weekly small group. And, uh, and there's a memory verse that's attached to it. There's just all kinds of different ways that you're reinforcing the lesson. Uh, behavioral teaching. Uh, and with a campaign, each weekend message is designed to cause people to become doers of the word and not hearers only. You know, each sermon has either a homework assignment or there's an event after the service, a ministry fair, a mission fair, where people can act on what they've learned. And also in the small groups, you're doing chat, so you've got an opportunity for them to uh, act on what they've learned. You check back with them to see how they're doing on it. And they have an opportunity to teach somebody else. So there's a lot of behavior involved. Uh, exponential thinking uh, is, is what happens. Uh, when you have a campaign. You begin to, to set uh, God-sized goals for your congregation. You know, if you've got four groups, you might ask, well, what if we prayed and worked to have 40 groups? Uh, you know, if we've got uh, 10 uh, small groups, well, what if we ask God for 100 small groups? And so at the start of the campaigns, we try and set a God-sized goal for what we're trying to do, and, and we tend to think in, in a way that stretches our faith. So those are the ways that, that the purpose-driven model can help you uh, develop committed disciples. You've got a process in place that uh, begins to uh, build the five purposes into the life of the individual uh, in a balanced way. You've got commitment cards, classes, covenants, small groups, and, uh, and campaigns. For me, this was one of the most attractive things about the purpose-driven model. Uh, when I was pastoring in a traditional church, our, our biggest struggle was getting people to genuinely live out their Christian faith. Uh, we had a lot of people who were going through the motions. We had a lot of people who had some head knowledge, but it wasn't making its way into their hands, feet, and mouths. And so it, uh, when, once we started in with the Purpose Driven, I began to see real life change in the hearts and lives uh, of my people. And, uh, and it's been real excited. A wonderful, wonderful tool.